Vladdy, Sports Information Director forever at the <laughs> University of Colorado, my alma mater. How are you doing? You can say I'm the Department Dinosaur, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, sir, man. I remember meeting you back in, so I was there with Doc in 94, I started there in 94, 95. Shit, you've been there. A little grayer, but you look the same, except your glasses. <laughs> did you get, uh, did you get uh, Lasix? It's weird. I only need them at certain times, and I'm diabetic, so depending on my blood sugar, sometimes I can see fine. Other times I can't see at all. So this goes with the territory. But yeah, this is my uh, wrapping up my what now 38th year as SID because uh, I was hired on July 24th, 1984 as SID. So I guess I begin year 39 here in, uh, in a week and a half. <laughs> you've, you've ridden the roller coaster, the ups and downs, and. I was there during all the ups mostly, and you've been through every down and up, and that's awesome. National championships. So, and uh, speaking of when I was there, now someone who I was there with, too, actually. shiverini has been there for a while, but Coach uh, Terrell. I love that. I remember him when I was a student. That's the only time. Now, a certain head coach that took over for McCartney, we, I used to call him Senator Neuheisel because he was very good at telling you – stuff coach Terrell was cool I always liked him he's very genuine and it seems he's doing really well with the recruiting because a lot of parents are seeing that same thing so yeah. oh be, be nice to Rick he's one of my best friends because okay my bad everything's not what they appear especially with the Denver media at times when they decide to gang up on somebody and I still say Rick's biggest problem really wasn't his was he came in at a time and it's still kind of hurting it today uh if you haven't uh sown your oats so to speak as a coordinator the rest of the profession kind of resents somebody getting a head job without being a coordinator first. And I think that was the big thing against Rick at the time was that he had never been a coordinator and he was 33, but he interviewed the best of the four by far. And that's why Bill Moore gave him the job. And, you know, we didn't stink under Rick, you know, by any means of the, no. the issue in 97 where he had to forfeit the games was because uh, it was under McCartney's watch and the compliance, but that was still ridiculous. It's, it's how, you know, I'm not going to bash the incident really technically on record a lot, but to make us forfeit, uh, the five wins that year because Darren Fisk was at a junior college for one week in August, not on any kind of team, and forgot to write on his application when he went to the next junior college. They made us forfeit those five games. So, and the next penalty, I believe, after that was uh, no, this was years later after we admitted we were over undercharging walk ons for meals. We got tagged a thousand dollar fine, and Alabama's kids were caught selling textbooks. And, they were fined not even half that much. So they go after who they want to. The old, the old joke is they're going to go after UNC. Oh, that's Northern Colorado and not North Carolina. <laughs> hey, we'll, um, we'll speak, that's that. <laughs> speaking of Coach Mack, how's he doing? Mack is uh, 80 now, and he's hanging in there. You know, obviously he's been battling the uh, Alzheimer's to a degree. But, you know, from what I understand, he's got really good days at times. And, other times I've talked to him and he'll forget the most simplest thing you think he can remember, but that's the nature of the disease. Yeah. But most, more, more or less, he's doing pretty good. He looks great when you see photos on the internet and they just had the, uh, they had to do a McCarty reunion every year, <clears throat> every summer, all the family comes in from all over the country and they take up the whole front uh, area at Pasta Jays. You know, remember Pasta Jays down in the mall. They're I do remember Pasta Jays. They all look great. Awesome. So now I brought you on, obviously to talk about sports, but, with that Supreme Court ruling against the Supreme Court ruling against the NCAA, now that name, image, and likeness, and we we're talking about how student athletes can um, capitalize on that now, make some money. And then you brought up something that we taught that I didn't really take in consideration before that we we came on about you know can they use the school's logo, the school's brand and stuff when they when they advertise themselves. So and you said that's a very slippery slope kind of deal right now where you don't really know you're still learning as you go i would say the the uh, phrase gray area is not big enough to cover what we're going through right now <laughs> our compliance people were wondering how the fresno state twins could actually do that with the fresno state jerseys but then again we got to remember there's 19 different states that pass this now with 19 different sets of rules and maybe that's okay in california um i, I don't know if that's okay in colorado without the kids having to pay the rights fee for logos that, you know, if somebody wants to do a CU shirt, you know, the school gets somewhere between like seven and 14%. But, you know, what we're finding is no one's really scored a huge, you know, six figure deal that we've heard of just yet. 
and if, it, if there are any out there, it's very few. Most of the trade outs, I think, that are we've seen nationwide, and I think all right now with most of our players, athletes, have been food trade outs. You know, they mentioned uh, there's a place up on the uh, hill that does chicken wings, and I think a couple of our players uh, got contracted out with them as long as they go on Twitter and Instagram and whatever other social media outlets they have. and mention that outlet like once or twice a week they can go in and get as many chicken wings as they want so and there's a lot of other food deals being set so you know the, the there's going to be a lot of problematic things that evolve from this is it going to be the end of amateurism or college athletics i think it's way too early to say that's an armageddon but you know at the same time the minute a quarterback signs some kind of uh financial deal where it's you know six figures or well into six figures is he going to share that with his offensive lineman you know can he share with his offensive linemen if he's permitted to? What would they have to do to qualify for it? And the minute somebody signs for any money, you know the IRS is going to be involved because that's going to be taxable income. So, you know, the, like I said, the gray area right now is just too expansive to really figure out exactly what is definite and what isn't right now. So the waters are a little bit murky, but we're wading through them, and you know, hopefully uh, the kids will benefit from it because that's the whole purpose of this going back to when Jeremy Bloom got shafted back in 2002. And that kind of, you know, that might have started it more than the O'Bannon and stuff, to be honest, because, you know, Jeremy's case, you know, I was at the court ruling that was final that the judge felt he had to rule with the NCAA. But I also remember the judge turning to the three NCAA lawyers who were sitting there smug as all hell and said, you, you people had the chance to do the right thing and you chose not to. And in Jeremy's case, they were saying, look, you've got players that sign contracts to make $400,000 uh, simple, similar kind of money when they play minor league baseball, but they're still eligible to play college football or whatever sport. And in Jeremy's case, you know, it was either they never understood this or they didn't want to understand it, but, you know, skiers, there's no ski races where somebody wins the race, they win money. It's all sponsorship. It's all, you know, fist points, things like that, competition worldwide. But there are, <clears throat> if there are any ski races for money, I certainly don't know any, if many. Now, I'm sure World Cup, you know, there's probably money for that, but most of these competitions where a guy like Bloom is trying to make the Olympic team, you know, I, I don't think first place is paying anything. And, and even if he did back then, he could not accept it. So his only way of sponsoring himself to uh, ski for the U.S. national team was to go out and get some sponsorships. And that kind of started the ball rolling. And, you know, Jeremy is uh, basking in the glow right now after these rulings came down. Did you watch that uh, documentary that he put out? Uh, which one? <laughs> I think it was the one on the the. It was right before the ruling. He did it because uh, Rick George was on there. He uh, did a documentary yeah. about the students, athletes, and his whole case and athletes getting paid. You know, because they are the machine that makes these sports. You know, the, all these schools are signing all these contracts, and he's talking about students should be getting paid. So he was for it. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, and you know. I have my own personal view on that because it seems like a lot of these athletes that really want a lot of money are forgetting what the school is paying for them to start with. I mean, we're uh, out of state student athlete at CU over five years. We're probably spending well over a hundred thousand dollars a year. When you factor in everything, you know, tuition alone is in the 60,000 range. Then you've got the nutrition, the sports medicine, the equipment, all that adds together academic tutoring that, you know, they're getting for free and they're getting quality services for free. And it seems like that's kind of forgotten in all this to a degree. So, you know, the whole paying for play, and I think part of it's on the coaches that, you know, you got a guy like Saban making, what, eight, nine, ten million a year, and yeah. you know, a couple other coaches way up in that range. And they're seeing the coach get that kind of money. Well, the coach is getting that kind of money because the players are playing for him. So I get that. I get the animosity that can be created there. But at the same time, I think they're also forgetting about Title IX, where, yeah, football brings in all these bucks. and. Yeah, football does spend a lot of what they bring in, but I don't know of any Division One program really that's spending more on football than they bring in because a lot of that income has to go to uh, supporting all the other sports. And not just the women's sports, really outside of men's basketball. You know, I imagine women's basketball makes some, might make some money in places like Connecticut and Tennessee. But, uh, you know, baseball might break even in some places. We don't have baseball, so I don't know the income that they can bring in or the revenue they can bring in, but you know, and I'm sure hockey, you know, teams that sell out their hockey arenas, maybe DU makes a decent t uh, profit and coming close to sponsoring their hockey team. But, you know, when you look at all those other Olympic sports, 
you know, and I love them. Don't get me wrong. I love our track teams, our golf teams, soccer, whatever, but they don't make enough money to uh, pay for themselves. And when you bring Title IX into the equation, you know, they've, uh, that's where that extra football income, income goes to help sponsor those sports that they exist. And as long as the NCAA has a sports minimum of 16, that's got to happen. And the worst thing that can happen in, in my eyes and for those sports is if the NCAA comes back and says, all right, now you only need to sponsor 10 sports to be Division One." you're going to see massive, a lot of these massive programs cut and go to club sports, which, you know, I don't think anybody wants to see, you know, I'm sure they can be saved through massive fundraising efforts. You know, the alumni are going to want to support the programs. You, know, you saw what happened at Stanford with the 11 sports they cut, they brought back because they had alumni in those sports, you know, raise uh, their ire and fought to bring them back. So, you know, I don't think anybody wants to see massive cutting. It's always hard when you cut a sport, you know, we had to do it here in 1980 and, Again, when we had to cut the tennis back, men's tennis back in 2005. Shit, I was gone after that. I didn't know that they cut men's tennis, huh? Yeah. Oh, shit. <clears throat> um, do you do you, now if they don't ha- use the school's image and stuff, they get to keep all that, like the school's branding and, and logos and stuff, they get to keep all that money, right? The students, like, because most of them, it seems a lot of them. Are, are doing this through social media. They already had a large following and then they're just kind of capitalizing on that. Like those two Cavender twins, they had like 3 million some followers and now they're out in Times Square with their pictures up on the screen and stuff and signed deals with Boost. And I think they sent like two or three deals I read. They're gonna- Yeah, no, yeah they don't have to share the money with anybody they don't want it. And like I said, it's up to the, the quarterback who might get a hundred fifty thousand dollars to eat share that with his backups? Does he share that with his linemen that block for him? Does he share it with his running backs or his wide receivers that are catching passes? It's just, that's an unknown. And, you know, it's going to create a lot of, uh, you know, uh, tax problems. I'm sure when you pay somebody, they're going to have to file taxes. So, you know, who knows how that's going to happen. But and then, again, you got the uh, fitness place in Miami that's uh, taking, I guess, the money that he gave every year to the athletic department. And now he's going to give that to the 85 football players instead that are in scholarship, which... You know, if I'm a walk-on down there, it's like, well, why wouldn't you include me? You know, right. the, the poor walk-on stuff was doing. You know, how many walk-ons are going to benefit from? The, they're already paying for their education now. I don't know how they're going to get sponsors now. There might be some walk-ons out there that uh, might do extremely well. If you remember, Jeff Campbell came to see you as a walk-on in 1986. He earned a scholarship the second day in practice, and we weren't even a pad yet. But uh, that is definitely the exception rather than the norm. For that to happen so i think some walk-ons might be able to profit somehow but you know they're the ones that you know really kind of got a feel for because you know if they don't have many followers on uh and i guess that's where all the you know, I, I don't totally understand it but you know there's a way to monetize your followers when you have a lot of them on instagram and twitter and i guess reddit and i don't know about facebook but you know if they're out there saying hey i just went to uh, play sex tonight and had a great meal of the, the chicken wings are awesome and the fries were great and wash it down with a chocolate milkshake. It was a great meal. You know, I'm sure there are going to be people that go, I got to go try that place. And I would imagine part of this on the, the businesses end is they want that publicity. And then the other part is they want to support the program and support the athletes. And as long as they've got the extra revenue to do that, you know, you know great, great for them. You know, if I was a student now and playing football, I'd have right down Salvaggio's. Go, hey, let's strike up a little deal. I write some things up on Instagram and Twitter, and you give me free food. I'd be, so, oh, I would be in heaven. I love Salvador Joe's. I miss it. Yeah, um, still, you met just down there on 26th and Pearl. Yep, the, the chicken salad or the uh, roast beef. Hey, um, you mentioned something that I, I should have swung back to is so with Jeremy, you know, he couldn't do it. He, he had his issues with sponsorship, but yeah, you mentioned. A minor league baseball player could come in. A lot of them come in and start playing quarterback. A lot, uh, uh, Clat, the dude at Florida State that won, I forget, uh, won the Heisman or close to it. Some older guy who's like oh, thirty. Yeah. Um, oh, I know you're talking about. Um, was it uh, Wilson? Uh, Russell Russell Wilson was a minor league baseball player, wasn't he? Russell Wilson was. Well, John Elway was. Yeah, yeah, always. So that's right, because he played it because I grew up in upstate New York and he played for Oneani Yankees. Yeah. They signed him for a little bit. Um, so yeah, how could they they're getting paid? Maybe not a whole lot, but yet they can come in and play, no problems. Yeah, if you were 
if you were a high draft choice, you were still making some decent coin back in the 80s and 90s where, you know, I remember Jeremy's case, I think they were using some examples of some athletes that did sign contracts and they were playing minor league ball and they were being paid for 100000 a year. But, you know, and they're on the bus from Birmingham to Savannah and they're making 400 grand and somebody next to them is probably making 10. And yeah. that's also, also the nature of that piece. But, but that player can come back as long as he's not playing his sport in uh, college, he was eligible to play football. He just couldn't play on the baseball team. And there are probably other examples of that as well with other sports that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure there might have been a case with some hockey players that might have, you know, done something with maybe in track or throwing a shot put or, you know, maybe they wrestled or something. But, you know, um, if they were minor league hockey, there could have been some examples there. I don't know for sure. But, yeah, so that was the whole premise that really skiing and I imagine, you know, maybe some tennis players would have needed sponsorships to get their careers going. But, you know, think about tennis. If you're not doing really well by the time you're 15 or 16, you know, it seems like a lot of a lot of these pe people start on those pro tours at a very young age that they're not even considering college tennis to begin with. So I think skiing just stood out as being really unique. And it was just failed to be recognized back then. And, you know, here's Jeremy trying to represent his country and, uh, and you know, basically cut the shaft. I, I never knew he had a sister. I saw that that Molly. movie with it. <laughs> yeah, Molly, that one where she's a freaking hustler, gambler. I was like, what? Oh my God, I, I never knew that until I saw that movie. It was very interesting to know though, that there was another side. You know, here's Mr. All-American and meanwhile, he's got a sister who's just flying coast to coast running gambling rings and wow, that's... Well, he's a good journey. guy. He's kind of put out a, a misinformation thing out there when I saw him on an interview and he said that, you know, the, the NCAA doesn't pay for the scholarship. The schools don't even pay for the scholarships. That can get a scholarship donor. Well, you know, I guarantee you most schools are paying for scholarships. We all have scholarship donors, but, you know, I think outside of maybe the Stanford and some of those schools have got 800 billion or uh, 1 billion in their endowments, if that's how they're even paying for scholarships. You know, in Colorado, for example, we raise about a million a year offset scholarships from donors, but we're still on the hook for eight or nine million dollars to pay the university for the rest of the scholarships. And I don't know if there's a university out there that, you know, comps athletic scholarships and like everybody's paying back to campus something. I'd be real surprised if there's a campus that's comping scholarships. Yeah. I don't know. I just, uh, and you, you just sit there and mention Colorado and, and campuses, and I'm thinking, I can't, it is the prettiest campus in all America, <clears throat> the view and everything. And now how that, that stadium looks, God, I miss that place a whole lot. <laughs> we're up there, you know, I, I'd like to think we're number one, but I'm not arrogant enough to think that there are, are another beautiful campuses in the country by any means. There's some you walk on and you're like, wow, this is not beautiful. I'm not going to say where, because I've been to about 75 campuses, but you know, there, a lot of campuses have that unique thing, like it's really cool at Washington, and, you know, people boat to the campus you know, come across the lake, go to the games there. You know, the Rose Bowl where, uh, where uh, UCLA plays, you know, that's got an awesome backdrop. You know, that, that often finishes one, two with us for stadium backgrounds. You know, BYU's is beautiful as well with the mountain yeah. backdrop. You know, Air Force's is cool. You know, CSU's cool. Wyoming, anything with mountain backdrops is cool. And that's pretty much limited to the mountain time zone, more or less. You know, you got uh, some in California have that. But, uh, you know, beyond that, when you can utilize lakes in the background, like I'm sure in the Big Ten, there's a few of those. But, you know, there are a lot of stadiums that are uh, that are totally enclosed round, and you 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 don't really see what's outside of them anyway because the stadium rises so high. So, but as far as towns and everything, your builder just got voted again number one in America's uh, the best place to live by U.S. World News Report. So it was uh, two years in a row, Boulder got that ranking that just came out, I believe, two or three days ago. I believe it. I've always, I've never not had a good time there. I remember first being there and I was like, wow. And then just to, when I met Doc and got, you know, cause I grew up as a Buff fan back home in New York. And all of a sudden I, there was running out with Ralphie. That's like some of the, one of the coolest things ever. I couldn't believe, I, you know, I'm on the sidelines. I'm like, whoa, that, that was a really surreal experience for me. And I still cherish it to this day to be involved. And I, I will bleed black and gold. To the day I die, I I love the buffs. I've I've never got to run out because Ryan Ralphie because I uh, obviously ready to press box. I've actually only been on the field for one home game, 
you know, I've been on the field before on road games or bowl games, so I have to go down early, but home games, you know, you're in the press box and the, yeah, the bowl, bowl days, you're a busy guy. Well, they've had to wait to bring the stats down when they were done for the post game press conference <clears throat> and monitor that. But uh, ever since they had older, I kind of let the assistants run the press conference. It's cool for them to do so. But the only time I was ever on the field was when McCartney was going to resign after the game, resign slash retire, as it turned out. And so I had to go down there, obviously, to start the press conference and be present for that. And I remember Mac looking at me just like five minutes ago, what are you doing down here? And I was like, well, I'm down here because of what you're going to say in about 20 minutes. He just kind of laughed. And fortunately, it was a good thing I was down there because they had pulled Cornell Stewart out of the game. And he had set the Pig 12 total offensive mark, but on his last play in the previous series, he had lost it again because he got sacked. And I, I was down saying, hey, Cornell's got to get in there and, and get eight more yards or whatever it was. And they turned back in, and it looked like a curtain call, as it turned out. Put him back in, I think he threw an eight-yard pass to Christian Fourier to uh, top Mike Gundy again for the record. The only time I've ever been on the field during a game of the season. <laughs> you weren't there. You Even when Rashawn ran, ran for 2,000. I remember that Iowa State game, that big long run he had, and it was like you broke it. Oh. That's Actually, sad what happened to him. Story, quick story. That is also on the roof. Bill Monroe came to the press box and said, I need to talk to you. So, okay. And he goes, no, we got to go somewhere private. And I had no idea what's going on. I kind of figured he was going to tell me maybe we knew what bowl we were going to go to. So we go up to the roof, which is a little puzzling if that's what it was. And he literally says to me, right when we took over, after the game, uh, McCartney's going to announce that he's resigning. Boom, Rashawn went around the right end, 67 yards, touchdown. Everyone's pulling up 2,000 placards. Place is going up, and I'm literally like one of those moments. What did you just tell me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Max, uh, Max decided to hang it up. So, oh, wow, so do what you need to. And I'm like, all right, well, I got to get down there. I remember <laughs> I caused a fur here in the press box. I told John Mostyn from AP, who would never go down to the post game press box, I said, trust me, you'll thank me later, but I can't tell you now. You need to go down to the post game press conference. Then I left the press box. So I guess there was all these murmurs like, what's going on getting down there? So we had a bigger crowd than normal uh, down at Max Post Game that day. And sure enough, you know, I don't know if you remember, but Dave Logan and Les Shapiro were broadcasting the game on Channel 4. They actually left and drove back to Boulder and, and did a special report you know, about probably 15, 20 minutes after the game ended once at Newsday. Mm -hmm. Crazy, Jeez, crazy days. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I remember that. I remember, I remember so vividly. All my times with their coach Barnett when I was working with him. Yeah, I love that dude too. He was so nice to me. He was a good man. I really yeah. enjoyed him. It was good to see him get into our Hall of Fame. You know, that he was the first ballot, uh, uh, first ballot inductee, you know, after we put him on the ballot. <clears throat> and, you know, I don't want to talk all much about that quote unquote. I won't call it a scandal. I'll call it an ordeal that was largely created by, you know, some in the media. They're, People apologize for years later after what happened, but you know that wasn't a sanctioned recruiting party. It was four players off on their own, you know, doing something dumb, and sure enough, it led to the downfall of the program, which is you know really taken a long time to come out of. We sort of did in twenty, you know, Hawk had a had a good year there to a degree in two thousand seven, and I just met with him last week. He was in town for a wedding, and you know he realizes he would have done a lot of things differently, which you know. A lot of coaches would never fess up to that. I've been around a lot of head coaches in my time. And many of them will never admit that they made a mistake, but often pretty candid that he would have done a few things different. And, you know, the uh, Embo years, you know, the just staff just, you know, wasn't, I don't know if dysfunctional is the right word, but, you know, a lot of NFL guys on the staff. And the last time we had tried that was under Chuck Fairbanks, and that didn't really work when you had a lot of NFL experience. But I think they, automatically take with what they could do in the pros and try to apply it back to the colleges. And that doesn't always work. And, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, Mike Bone and Hawkins really should get credit for rebuilding the infrastructure that was torn down by a lot of people after Barnett was fired. Uh, you know, the whole recruiting thing where kids could only come in for a day and not really even see Boulder, see much of the campus. They were, you know, really in meetings most of the time and kids were leaving here you know, not really enjoying their recruiting visits. So that really, you know, hurt recruiting for a long time. But, you know, Hawk demanded those things be changed. And Bill DeStefano was 
you know, on board with Mike and, and Dan for correcting some of the things that have been done that have been broken down. So they really need credit for getting the infrastructure actually built back up. And, you know, Mike Bone, of course, started the popular Pearl Street Stampede, which, uh, you know, is popular to this day. And nobody ever thought of that. But Mike is really, really good at community relations and, you know, working with the fans and such. So he, he, he should get a lot of credit for that. And, you know, Rick George is, you know, if people don't consider Rick George one of the best athletic directors in the country, they don't know what they're talking about. And, you know, Rick got, uh, after sitting here myself since 1990, when we really started to push, after we got Dow Ward built, to push to get it into a practice facility, you know, that languished for 20, 22 years. And then Rick came in, developed a great finance plan, got the Champion Center and the indoor practice facility built in his third year by you know, before he finished his third year as athletic director, it was pretty much all done the spring of 2016. And he was here in August, 2013. So to build that 160 million dust, the million plus structure in that short amount of time and just the reviews it keeps getting. And it's still cool to walk into that, you know, now six years later that, you know, my, my remember where my office was in the old field house annex. Over yeah, the, the little the tiny, uh, little like, uh, I, yeah. I don't know how to describe it. Yeah, I know where your office was. New, New Highs will nick, nickname us the island of Misfit Toys. <laughs> we <were all> <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, you're way off like in this little spot. Go down yeah. and go around. Yeah, some, same with some of the coaches office. Like, I think Coach Kelly's office was somewhere in the stadium and I had to go, I had to go see her a couple of times. And yeah, yeah there's a couple yeah, of track, track was in the attic with us and, you know, I don't have to you know, be on the lookout for mother raccoon protecting her babies walking to my car <laughs> in the office at night and hearing him screech and being really freaked out. But, uh, you know, to the privilege of walking in a place like the Champion Center and then I've got a view of the stadium behind my office. And it's still cool, you know, six years later. You know, I was there 2014. We came in, my ex-wife and I, for uh, homecoming. You got, uh, we played UCLA. And so I was bringing her to, because the championship was still being built, and we came walking down into Dow Ward, and we walked out, you know, the little walkway there before you go into the doors, and you go by uh, Rick George's office. And then, so I walked by there, and then we went in, and did you, I don't know. All I know is I went to the bathroom, and, I, you know, not really paying attention, but there's a tall black guy, bald head. And I wash my hands. I walk out and I'm waiting for my ex-wife. And all of a sudden he goes, Hey, and it was Lance, Carl. <laughs> and, it, and he came over and, and, you know, it, it was so cool to see him. And then I introduced my wife and he took us into the strength conditioning center, took us outside, showed us all, you know, you know, my life, my, she loved it. And then he, and he took us in, we met Rick and he was so cordial and very, so nice to my wife. And, it was, it was good, you know, because I had told her about my history and she never knew because uh, I met her in Texas. You know, she did, I said, yeah, I used to, she's kind of, okay. And then all of a sudden I was there and it was nice. And then, um, is it MT or KT the downstairs? She's a strength coach. MT Eisner. <laughs> yeah. She snuck us into the champion center from, because we couldn't get in, you know, you get, it's all secure. Right. From down through the football field and then let us in there and then we walked and saw all the big all the uh uniforms and everything and then went to the weight room met drew and then uh met some i think it was a ga i can't remember but he took us he gave us a tour and took us in the new uh athletic training bill oh my god that's like high tech and then the pt center everything upstairs all the exercise physiology and everything. oh my that's like do like olympic athletes and stuff train there some of the technology they got for training athletes is amazing. That's pretty much just for ours, you know, because you, you do have 350 of them and places in UC around. You, you think you probably saw that tremendous uh, rehabilitation pool they have in sports medicine, which is yeah. really, really cool. But uh, yeah, that must be 2016. With 2014, the building wasn't really built yet. So if you were in for UCLA, that, okay, yeah, but, we, won, we won that game, right? No, it was, yeah, it was 20... 2016. We won 20 to 10. <laughs> We lost, we lost to them here in 2014. <laughs> what year? Well, I can't remember. I know, yeah. I know we went there one year. The year we went, okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, the year we went and, and met Lance and Rick, that was 2014. 2000, 
16 or 17. When you were snuck when in. We, yeah. yeah, that's when MT took us into. Yeah, that's okay. That's when it was. That's right. Because I remember the championship was still being built. So he took us out to the football field and showed us where everything was, uh, the construction was going on. It was cool. And then I was, I remember telling uh, Buster Wilbon, remember Buster? <laughs> Good old Alan, number 23, Buster Wilbon. Yeah, I, I I was chatting with him on Facebook, and I said, dude, you got to get back there and see it. It's just uh, beautiful. It's going to be gorgeous, and it turned out to be freaking the Ralphie and his handlers statue, and it is, oh, feels so yeah, good the, to be up off. The indoor practice facility is awesome. And it's that, right too. There. One of those that's built where you can actually punt in it without the – you know, the, the punter can't hit the roof with a really, really high punt, but, you know, it's functional enough where you can actually do the special team stuff in there as well, which, you know, a lot of indoor facilities don't allow for that. So it's, it's even great for the kickers and special teams. You know what made me sad was the hill, you know, that went down to the practice field. Cause I used to make my, I used to make my basketball players and my golf team, I used to call it, I call it puke hill. Cause I'd make them run until pretty much they'd puke and have new sprints and I'd, have them run all down Boulder Creek and I'd go go this way and they'd go down and come up this way. And then I'd make them do sprints up the, and uh, remember coach Simpson, the golf coach. Oh, of course. One of my best friends. Oh, yeah. Cause he, yeah. Cause he loved when I would torture him and he loved the puke hill. He <laughs> loved seeing those guys. He was all about conditioning. He was a good guy. He was a good man. Said well, they, here that he passed away. The story behind that hill was <clears throat> where the practice fields are now. That used to be, there were Quonset huts down there until I want to say around 1962 or three. Then they made them into practice fields for football, but that's also where the baseball field was. And so they moved out to East Campus. So that hill was created somewhere in the early 60s. And Steve Hatchell told me that the old equipment managers used to have to drive the truck down with the equipment. And they'd just go barreling down that thing and they had to aim properly so the truck would get over <laughs> on the bridge and not sail into the Boulder Creek. <laughs> oh god but there's some great pictures i think there's a picture we've got somewhere phil Irwin hiking up that hill after uh, practice and it, it was it was dirt for a long time i, I don't think it was paid until the late 80s early 90s it, some nice brick work was put in eventually and you know now it's uh it's not there anymore that hill's gone but they still come around to the other side and yeah. go down the side hill and then there's a well, they used to call it from the rec center, the dirt hill. They, I think they called it the Ho Chi Minh Trail. <laughs> the, uh, was the other one that you could hop over the northern or the westernest bridge and then sneak through the trees and get back and wind up behind the rec center. Do a lot of uh, the older guys come back? Because I remember when, like, uh, when I was a student there with Doc, and I remember like Ted, Ted Johnson would come back and Charles Johnson and Greg Beaker and um, Tony Birdie and – Oh God, who was Tony Birdie? It was so it was Chris. Who was that tackle opposite Tony? Derek West. Yes, uh, Derek West would come back, and because uh, I saw that Chris is Nioli's been elected to Hall of Fame, and he right. said he hasn't been back in like twenty some years. So we're looking for wow. Chris back. It's sporadic, you know. They come back in in different pods, you know, so to speak. Uh, sometimes they do little reunion trips together. Other times they come in for different reunions that we're running. Um, we're going to recognize the, we're recognizing this year, the uh, it was 2001 Big 12 champions or the, uh, and, oh, seven, we're going to recognize the 71 team in conjunction with Living Legends. The 71 team that I'm featuring right now in a series of my platitudes going back game by game where we went 10 and 2 and finished number three in the country. So, uh, Living Legends, Living Legends is a great program we created in the early 2000s where we honor uh, players for their, the first year they ever lettered at CU. So a lot of those guys in the 71 team, and I don't know if you know the history of that, but we did that with mostly sophomores that year. There's a tremendous amount of talent, but, you know, Ken Johnson was a sophomore. Uh, J.B. Kane was a sophomore. Um, Charlie Davis, running back, was a sophomore. You know, they're literally up and down the line, a lot of the line on both sides, they were sophomores. So, you know, to honor them with a living legend tag uh, 50 years after they lettered. And then also, since they were on that team, it's going to be fun to see those guys come back. That's cool. That's awesome. You get to see everyone. And 
you've got so many people that you've come across in life and seen some people be really successful. Clats on Fox Sports, Chris Fowler, Jeremy Bloom, Brendan Schaub. Brendan Schaub's like Mr. Podcast <laughs> you know, next to, you know. Don't forget Solomon Wilcox, you know. Oh yeah, and Alfred podcast. Williams and freaking Ted Johnson's over in Boston doing stuff, and Christian Fourier, Kate, Kate uh, Fagan. Well, Kate where is she? She was. She left ESPN, didn't she? She's. I don't see her. She, yeah, she left, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what she's doing now. But you know, you know, really, uh, you know, she credits me with helping get her start because I got an internship with uh, through Jim Gray, who's a buff, worked in sports innovation along with Chris Stella. But Jim Gray worked with me as a student, but. Jim Gray got her an internship with Conan O'Brien, and that kind of helped get Kate's career going. I don't take much credit for somebody that's got that kind of talent. Because I certainly didn't teach him how to write, but you know, Kate was a natural at that. You know, very, very personable. But yeah, but you know, Tom Brookshire, he's the one that laid the groundwork for all the future bus going into announcing because he was partnered for years with Jack Whitaker. And you know, I don't know if people remember Tom or not, but he was the uh, companion on all those NFL broadcasts with, with Jack for like I think 15, 16 years. It's it's funny you see all these schools like Alabama and you know Miami and Florida and everything, and then it, people don't realize how many buffs have made it to like very successful either in the NFL or after career after the NFL or just gone from right from college to the press box like Clatt and 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 like I said Shab Shab UFC into now he's just like podcasts podcaster of the year besides Joe Rogan he's got so much going on and. It's great to see all these guys successful, you know, and and it's funny too, because I remember Shab. I never saw anything special. Now he's a comedian and all these things. I'm like, I don't ever remember being that funny, but and we're or be we're, we're number 43, right? Yeah. <laughs> or being or being like a freaking beast. He was always Mr. Gentle Giant, and now he's <laughs> out there heavyweight, uh beating up guys in the UFC and getting beat up too, but he eventually realized he needs to get out. So he's doing well, I guess. He's got kids and stuff and everything. So that's well, awesome. Yeah. Leon White probably blazed the trail for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. You know, that's sad. You know, when I met Leon, you know, it's funny, and also here's Vader, and you see him. I used to work at uh Potters, and he'd be in there, like, you know. Oh yeah. Try to tell a 300 guy who's drunk off his ass and he's being a little belligerent and he's a wrestler. Um, Leon, um, could you not drink anymore and leave it? But he was always sweet as big as he I was. Remember, I remember walking by and he was in Juanita's and he was sitting in the booth by himself. So I walked by and he was like, hey, hey, Leon, come here. You're going to drink with me. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> and he goes, well, just bring him one of my margaritas. Well, the margarita, I'm looking at it like, this is like seven ounces of tequila and a splash of sweet and sour. And oh my <laughs> God, he's sitting across from me, doubting him like, you know, quickly and his head's all sweating. And I'm like, Leon, if you pass out, I ain't giving you mouth to mouth. <laughs> you know what he did for me? So after I graduated from CU, I ended up back in New York. I was doing, uh, I was trying to get a grab assistant position with Syracuse University. I was working with uh, Mike Gerber. But anyways, so I was home, and at the time, we, we still have us the, the Broome County Arena, and the WWF was there. And so this was like 97, 98, and I knew he was coming. So I just went to the back door before the show started. And, of course, you know, there wasn't security like there is now. And I just bang on the door, and a guy opens it. I go, hey, I'm friends with uh, Vader, Leon White. Could you tell they went and got him, and he came back, and he brought me in, and he took me backstage. Steve Austin was there and stuff. Then he put me up in the stands, and he forgot where he put me. He won his match, and he came out, and he was looking up because he was going to bring me out of the crowd. He goes, I lost sight of you. He goes, I was going to bring you out because I think it was being televised. I can't remember. But it was so cool. He just brought me in, took me out backstage, and I can't remember. I think The Rock was there, and Austin was there with, like, a body double. The guy looked exactly like a bald head, everything, and – and uh. Yeah, it's so awesome to just see him. And, and then also he was gone. You know, they got in the road. He, I think he left with a couple guys in the car and see you. That was it. We've had some characters through our time, that's for sure. <laughs> Is his son? Where's his son? His son ended up in Oklahoma. Did he ever make anything of himself? Yes, he went to Oklahoma. And I think he's living back in Colorado now because he was, you know, we did the memorial for him about, I think, five years ago now he's been gone. So, but Jesse, Jesse was local then. So, but, 
yeah, no, you, you go through the character we've had in our time, you know, and it's just, uh, you know, like, remember, remember the St. Paul beer commercials? The, uh, I think so. That was Jeff Raymond, who was uh, a defensive back for us, and he would turn an interception for a touchdown against Nebraska in 67, and we had beaten him for another 19 years. So, you know, he went into some acting. And, you know, uh, Pancho Hodges right now from basketball, I think you've seen Pancho's been uh, got a decent, you know, movie career going. Uh, not on the A list yet, but uh, he he was on a Law and Order playing a basketball player that uh, murdered a uh, obnoxious fan. And you know, you're looking at him and do that. My God, that's Pancho Hodges. <laughs> you know who I saw? This was about ten years ago, but he was a walk on, and he was a no. He was he was on the practice squad for the women's team. He would help them. His name was. Chris or so I can't remember his name. He was on a commercial for Verizon, like the mm. main character in the first commercial for Verizon. I was like, and I kept on his name is Anthony, Anthony something, because I remember I was talking to Chris Copeland about it. And I'm like, man, that looks like him. And it turned out it was him on that commercial. Yeah, and Darren amazing. Tadlock. I told you about Darren. He was in that uh Jean-Claude Van Damme uh Amazon series. He I was didn't know he, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I yeah, like the first couple episodes, he was he was his nemesis, Jean Claude's nemesis, and I'm like, what? When? I never knew you were were Hollywood. God, I haven't seen him in forever. It's nice to see some guys that you haven't seen, like Keith Keith Hayes, like some opera singer now, is he in New York? Keith Miller was uh, New York Met for or a Keith while. Miller, yeah. Secure, yeah. He came Miller. into town every now and then we get together, but yeah, we uh, we hope we can time it up next year with COVID done that he can come in and sing a national anthem. Well, at a basketball oh, that'd be sweet. Be really good. But, yeah, no, the kid, think of a guy, we called him the kid from Ovid. Think of a kid from Ovid, Colorado, wanted to sing. I remember opera. that. <laughs> it was, he was a, he was very eclectic. I always remember him. He'd do, I liked Keith a lot. And then Ben Nichols and God, he, he was, he was, a, my, he, got, he got really large there for a little bit. And, 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 my, and uh, my favorite trivia question though is, uh, this CU football player made was one of three people who made the longest road trip in human history. Name him. Who's that? Ben Nichols? No. It's a trivia question. But name this buff. It was one of three men that made the longest road trip in human history. I don't know. Who is it? Because of the position of where the moon was, and they still rotated around it, Jack Swigert was a buff. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Swagger. Played, played by Kevin Bacon in Apollo 13. I was going to say, yeah, is he an astronaut? Oh, sh yeah. oh yeah. Duh. Yeah, made the longest one. Okay, there you go. Yeah. And Chris Maloney. Oh. Went, I had a history class with Chris Maloney, and, of course, he was uh, Law and Order Special Victims Unit in Oz. So we've had a few buffs, and I don't think people realize that. That's uh, right. Frank Burns I, on MASH was a buff. <laughs> that's right. I forgot he's the uh, uh, S. And he was one that one, one hot. Wet Summer, was he? That's a, you know that movie with, uh, yeah, it was One Hot Wet Summer, right? It's like a comedy kind of black comedy. It was with um, so. Amy Poehler and um, Bradley, what's his name? The guy who played American okay. Sniper. Yeah. Bradley yeah. Was, but uh, yeah, that, that guy, Chris Maloney, whatever his name is. Yeah. Hey. Well, um, I think his first gig was he was uh, going to marry Julia Roberts and Runaway Bride. And then yeah. uh, Richard came in and stole our own. <laughs> that was yeah, so see, people, there are a lot of buffs out there. Go buffs. Remember that. Go buffs. Hey, one, so one mystery we've never solved. And somebody told me in the movie Mission to Mars, somebody took a CU helmet decal and put it on the spaceship. And I've tried to find it where that was in the movie, but I've never been able to find it. But I was told on good authority that there's a CU logo on that in that movie. <laughs> So anyone watching this podcast, if you can find it, let us know. And the yes, all-time please. great history, we have, we have no idea where in 1971, you know, we do honorary C's, right, for people that support the program. For some reason, Glenn uh, or Milburn Stone, who played Doc on Gunsmoke, got an honorary C. And he was not a C graduate, had no ties in school, but maybe it was Eddie Crowder's favorite show. I don't know. But for some reason, <laughs> honorary C recipient <laughs> so how are the buffs gonna look this year i mean they're doing well in recruiting i think we're gonna be you know i, I don't always say this but when i think it's true i say it i think we're gonna be better than people give us credit for uh just because you know 
in the last year, you know, we got a, I wouldn't say we fell apart toward the end. We really didn't handle the Utah game well. And then the bowl game, we finally had a few COVID issues rise up that cost some players playing and a lot of defensive linemen. But, you know, open up 4 0. You know, Carl DeRoe in 228 days between being hired and watching his team's first practice. And, you know, at least the other coaches that got hired last year either had some spring ball or, like the case of Washington, Jimmy Lake, they didn't have spring ball, but he was an assistant, so he had seen the team. You know, Carl comes in, was hired late because, you know, Mel goes off to Michigan State as late as he did. You know, Carl's not even hired until February 23rd. Doesn't get our first practice till October 9th. And you can't watch the kids end of the workouts, but, you know, that's not a practice anyway when kids are doing seven on seven. So if you go 228 days without seeing your team, at that point, your first game is less than a month away. And come out, we look, remember, we jumped on UCLA 35 to seven. We're like, holy cow, holy cow, this is going to be great. And they fought back eventually. And then we went to Stanford, which, you know, we've now beaten them three times in a row after they were dominating us for a while. So, you know, I like our prospects. You know, the, um, the quarterback race will be interesting between uh, JT Shroud, transfer from Tennessee, you know, and uh, Brendan Lewis and Drew Carter. And between the three of those, you know, I think we're going to be set a quarterback here for a while. Uh, you know, I have read where somebody rated our receivers 11th in the Pac 12. And I'm just laughing. It's like, you don't know anything. We are. We are loaded at wide receiver. And Levante Chenault might be a better receiver than his brother, which is scary to think. Now, I don't know if he's going to have the vision of this guy. Well, this guy tremendous vision. But Levante, the coaches will tell you, are probably the better receiver of the two. And, you know, you look at that whole group up and down. We're going to be loaded at receiver again. So those guys are going to have no shortage of guys to go to. Brendan Rice kind of had his coming out party in the Utah game. Yes, uh, The offensive line, uh, you know, Mitch Rodriguez is really high on the line, especially Kari Kuch. And Kari is, is going to be one of those guys that comes out of nowhere and be a good draft pick for somebody. Uh, you know, we wish Will Sherman would have hung around for one more year. But, you know, he was here four years and wanted to go pro. You know, he drafted. So we're all 11 guys in our history that decided to be able to declare early to the draft have been drafted. Not many schools can say that. So uh, good luck to Will. And you know, defensively, you know, that might be where the question marks are because we're pretty young still up front. But the uh, secondary's got two good guys back there with experience, between Isaiah Lewis and Makai Blackman. You know, linebacker, you know, I'm really kind of, uh, I'll, I'll use the word peeve, that Carson Wells is getting the, the attention that he should on preseason All-America team, or even preseason All-Pac-12 team. You know, I see him third and fourth. And, you know, <laughs> if I was allowed to, if it wouldn't be some kind of copyright infringement, I, I would make the cover of my media guide with the in and out logo and have, Nate Landman on one side and Carson Wells on the other playing, <laughs> playing off our in and out side. So I'm going to figure out how to exactly still do something like that, but obviously not infringe on the in and out logo because that would land me in some trouble. <laughs> so. Hey, uh, you mentioned about JT Shroud. What do you think about the transfer polo? Do you, do you, is it, here's, here's my, I mean, it almost seems like guys, if they don't get their way, if I'm not going to start for some, it's like, I'm just going to transfer and go somewhere else. It's like, what happened to hard work? We're not we're rewarding guys for here, come here and play because, you know, you're not going to make it there. So come play with us. And I don't know. It's like, what happened to like putting in, you know, earn your spot. I mean, don't just quit. What yeah. do you think about that transfer portal? You know, I think, and you see so many kids that are not landing anywhere with scholarships. And I think to some degree, there's the player that gets upset he's not getting the playing time or may have been lied to somehow in recruiting. So to me, you know, I think you'd see less of that if they still had to sit out a year. And, but, you know, that's just like rarely transferring. But, you know, I think it would make sense, let's say you came in and there a new coach or came in and an old coach, a new coach comes in and is changing up the offense and the defense. And now you went from being a prominent uh, figure in whether you're planning and scheming to, really being on the backside looking in, I think it would make sense for those kids saying, well, I'm not going to yeah, play here. I agree. And those kids could have a chance to go somewhere. And I know they always point to the thing, the coach can leave and not be penalized. Why well, can't the player? But, you know, I just see for what it is, you know, in some player skates, it's good if they're told. If coaches are probably say, saying, look, you're, you're really not fitting in our plan, you know, find a place if, if you want to play. And, you know, we got some kids that uh, aren't going to the team anymore that aren't in the transfer portal. 
not they were in front of, but they want to stay here and graduate. So, you know, that's the, uh, it goes on in places too, but I think by and large, you're right, you're gonna see some kids just get mad one day that maybe I get yelled at in practice or now, wait, I'm third on the depth chart, what? I'm out of here. Uh, see the handwriting on the wall with a better player coming into their position that alludes to the point you just made about competing. So, you know, I think there's good and bad with it. Like literally everything in college football, there's, there's good with some bad. Yeah, true. Are there going to be full stands, uh, full capacity at uh, Folsom Field this year? We got cleared at full capacity to all our home venues about a month ago. Now, you know, that's obviously contingent on the variant and how things change, you know, until I think the the virus is totally under control. You know, I think anything can happen at any time. But right now we're planning on, on full capacity for everything, Folsom Field, the event center, uh, private field for soccer. So is a, are they playing CSU this year, first game? No, Northern Colorado actually on Friday night. That's right. so we've entered a deal with CSU. We're basically two years on, two years off. You know, they're scheduling other Power 5 programs because we're going to different parts of the country. We wanted a little bit more freedom ourselves to bring in some different teams and go elsewhere ourselves. We've uh, just added three games in the Dallas area in our future schedules uh, in the 30s because we're recruiting Texas. we got 20. Yeah. So Big we have 22 time. players uh, from Texas on our roster now. So we want to be able to go down there and bring those kids home once every now and then. So right now we've got five road trips to Texas in the next 16 years. Uh, we go to TCU, we go to Houston, we go to North Texas, which is starting to schedule a few power of five programs home and road, go to SMU. And we have the fifth one from Texas, it's a home and home with Oklahoma State. But people from Dallas will drive to Stillwater. We've got recruits in that area. I'm still. I'm the bird dogger for the schedule. I know what Rick wants, I know what Carl wants. I work with uh, my counterparts at other schools and gauge their interest in playing us. And so we'll probably get to Texas one or two more times and you know try to, I think along the lines at some point we will re rekindle most of our rivalries with everybody we were from the big eight. You know, I, I don't know about the four guys from the big 12 necessarily, but you know, we, we do have Kansas State on the future schedule. We got Missouri on the future schedule, Oklahoma State on the future schedule. Nebraska uh, comes back in 23 and 24. So that's four of the other seven teams. So, you know, at some point, I think we'll do Iowa State, Kansas, and uh, Oklahoma at some point, you know, in the next 20 years. I'd love to see, you know, at least got a home and home with all those at some point again to keep those series somehow alive. Yeah, that'd be cool. Iowa State, who, who would have thunk it? Matt Campbell's got a good thing going there. You know, I was talking about future schedules is you never know in college football, the only sport, you got team scheduling games about 20, 39, 20, yeah, 40. Right. And it's the only sport that does that. But, you know, for example, back in 1988, John Burianic worked at home and home with Wisconsin. And it, Wisconsin at the time was kind of a perennial. Uh, they're going to go four and seven, finish, you know, somewhere eighth, eighth in, the, in the Big Ten. By the time we came around playing them seven years later, they were the defending league and Rose Bowl champions. So you never really know what a team is going to be like when you're scheduling that far out. I remember that game. It was a night game, right, at Folsom? And uh, yeah. they, had those, they had those two good running backs, um, but we beat them because we had that freaking solid yeah. team of yeah. Cordell, Michael, Derek West, Tony Birdie, Rashawn. I remember, God, Matt Russell. Te oh, God, oh, that, that team, team was loaded. fucking loaded. Mm -hmm. All 11 starters in the offense eventually played in the NFL. And I remember they were the only team who were shot under 100 yards, but he scored four touchdowns and all of them were short. You know, they, they were like three of them were wide open. They were at the 20 yard line each time. He, he would add 60 more yards. So, well, listen, the legend of Dave Platty, everyone. He is the sports information director from my alma mater, the University of Colorado. Go Buffs. Dave Platty, the fossil himself, on my podcast. I appreciate it, Dave. Thank you for coming on. Oh, nice for a dinosaur to get in view, right? Uh, and listen, um, I will probably have this all out tomorrow on audio and uh, my YouTube channel. So, and uh, hey. do you have like Instagram or something? Uh, I'm just a Facebook and Twitter guy. It should be the link I'll post it. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, and and uh, give that out too. Give your Facebook and your. Uh, all your, your handles, all that stuff for people that don't know can follow you. My Facebook, my Twitter handle is cleverly at David Flatty. <laughs> uh, Facebook, I think, is facebook.com slash David Flatty. 
I remember the Italian go. last names. There aren't a whole lot of us anywhere. Uh, I think there's 40 total Fridays in the States. I'm sure that Ellis Island or whatever the relatives came over 100 years ago was chopped up from something that had a lot more letters than five. You know, aren't many oh, times. I forgot, <laughs> I, forgot to, I forgot to tell you, we got a friend in common, Marlon Morris. Ah, Marlon. <laughs> yeah, I worked with him in New York City. I worked, we worked together at Equinox on 85th and 3rd. And, and uh, yeah, Marlon, Marlon Moore. Hey, it's a good dude. He was a DJ in her 25th reunion. And we're still Facebook friends. <laughs> ha, yep. All right. Yeah, I told him you were coming on too, because we still keep in touch. Yeah. He gave me a, we through Facebook and then we text every now and then. Well, listen, thank you for coming on, Dave. I really, it was great to see you. Good to see you're doing well. I hope the buffs you, kick ass this year and have a great night, man. You do. All right. See you, Dave. Hey, where in New York were you from? Uh, Binghamton. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, I go back, but all my family's still there, but I do not miss the winters and the taxes no. and none of that stuff. Well, the winters with the cold air with the ocean and the uh, summers with the classic 89 degrees and 95% humidity where you take a yeah. shower, <laughs> you sweat. You yeah. You come, <laughs> you come on, you're already drenched again. Year's nope, I don't April, miss it. April, September, October. <laughs> I, I do miss October. When leaves are changing, I do miss October. That's it. And oh Italian God. food. Good pizza. I miss good pizza. Yeah. Where do you live? So we're in Helena. <laughs> what, what's that? You're up in Helena? Yeah. And there's actually yeah. a decent, there's a place here. It's not too bad. Their pizza's not, it's wood fired, and, but it's hard. You know, you get, you get jaded and you're just like, eh. I tell people all the time. If they tell you it's New York pizza, there's one simple trick. Fold it, and do you see any orange grease drip off? There you go. No orange grease, it's not authentic. <laughs> no, no. Your bread, your bread, your your crust should be soggy by the time you get to it. Yep. <laughs> All right. Hey, have a great night, Dave. Thanks, Dave. You too. All right, bye. Bye.